Okay, welcome to Mod 140, Week 2. Today we're going to go over Chapter 5, Understanding Consumer Behavior. So here we go, Mod 140, Marketing. So today what we're going to talk about is, um, we're going to talk about why managers should understand consumer behavior. We're going to talk about components of the consumer decision-making process. We're going to talk about the post-purchase evaluation process. We're going to talk about cultural and social factors that affect consumer buying decisions, and as well as the psychological factors that affect consumer buying decisions. All right. So behind the visible act of making a purchase, there lies an important decision process through which a buyer experiences whereby they make a, they make a purchase decision. The experience will dictate whether a customer will or will not purchase a product. Okay, so there are five stages of that process. And this was one of your uh, Survey Monkey questions. I believe it was number one. What are the five stages that a cons customer goes through when making a decision to purchase a product? Well, number one is problem recognition. Number two, information search. Three, alternative evaluation. Four post, I mean, excuse me, four purchase decision and five post purchase decision. So we're going to go through all of these. So let's look at the first one. The number one says problem recognition, but I like to call it more of a needs recognition. Just It's just recognizing that you have a need. Um, it, it could be as simple as, we're making pasta tonight. Hey, can you go to the store and get some spaghetti? Or, I'm thirsty and I'd like a root beer. Or it could be as complex as, my car is getting old and I need a new car. So, some things are simple. Some things take a little bit more thought process. Um, these arrows um, represent internal stimuli, which is the thought process of the consumer's own thought process based on their own experiences, memories, and, um, you know, information that they've obtained themselves. And then there's the external stimuli, and this comes from commercials, ads, um, advice from friends, and um, some of the research that they've done. All right, and then we have present status here on the scales as opposed to preferred status. Present status is their point where they don't have the product. Where they'd like to be is their preferred state, where they have the product. My present status is I don't have the pasta. My preferred status is I'd like to have the pasta so I can make pasta tonight. Or my present status is I don't have a reliable car. My preferred status is I need a reliable car, so I'd like to go out and buy a new one. So marketing helps consumers recognize an imbalance between the present status and the preferred state. All right, so these are red, so you want to highlight these. Value is a personal assessment of the net worth one obtains from making a purchase. Purchases are made based upon perceived value, which is what you expect to get. So a lot of times, you know, we have a perceived value, or we're, or we have an expectation of what we're going to get, and sometimes we're, we're happy, sometimes we're satisfied, but sometimes we're not. Sometimes we're disappointed, and that's unfortunate. So this next one right here, utilitarian value, I want you to highlight that. This is derived from a product or service that helps a consumer solve a problem or accomplish a task. So, um, I need dishwashing liquid, utilitarian value. That dishwashing liquid helps me solve a problem, helps me wash my dishes. Um, hedonic, hedonic value, or you call it hedonistic value, is the end result rather than a means to an end. So here's what that means. When I buy dishwashing liquid, it's a means to an end. My, the problem I want to solve is I want clean dishes. 
Whereas if I buy a root beer, it's because I enjoy drinking the root beer. It has the value in it of itself. It's not solving a problem. It's not, I'm not getting it for some other purpose. The, the, the purpose in and of itself. Hedon means pleasure. So a hedonistic value means pleasure value. So if I drink the root beer, I'm getting pleasure. Or I eat a candy bar. The value is an end in itself rather than a means to an end. So if I was to buy a bag of sugar and flour, those are means to an end. I'm going to make some cookies. And so the cookies will become the end product. So they become utilitarian value because they're a means to an end as opposed to the value in them of themselves. Unless I'm one of those weird people who just take a spoon and eat sugar. <laughs> there are some people like that, so. Talking about me. No, you don't do that. No, you're right. <laughs> All right, stimulus. This is any unit of input affecting one or more of the five senses. So when you have, that, by the way, highlight that. That should be highlight senses too. Highlight that part and the word stimulus as well. So a commercial you see on TV, that's sight and sound. Um, when you walk into a bakery, what's the first thing that hits you? It's the smell of the baked goods, right? Or a flower store. Um, or when you go to a store and they give you samples that affects your taste um, or they let you hold touch something touch so all the five senses affect our decision making our biggest ones are sight and hearing because again that's where advertisement comes in through magazines or television or radio sometimes they put samples of cologne in a magazine and get the smell. All right. Internal information search. An internal information search is the process of recalling information in memory. So I highlight this first line right here. This includes prior experience or prior knowledge about a product. Um, <clears throat> some people are very brand loyal. If they're happy with the brand, they stick with it. Hey, but, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. If it's working fine for you, why would you change? If you're happy with it. So, um, or they may have had bad experiences with a product. One of the things I used to remember as a kid, I used to hate Captain Crunch. And, but Captain Crunch was always advertised as a cereal that stays crunchy in milk. But I always thought of it as a cereal that gets nasty in milk. It gets mushy. So... I always ex remember that product, so I never buy it because it's just nasty. <laughs> Even though it says they're supposed to stay crunchy. They're they lying. Don't. They're lying. They lie. Or M&Ms, they melt in your hand, not in your mouth, right? Okay. External information search. I highlight the title there and this one right here. Seeks information in outside environment. We have non-marketing control and marketing control. External information may be obtained through from non-marketing control sources or marketing controlled sources. You know, you have your advertisement like your billboards, but you also might have people driving a particular car. If people are driving a car, that, that in a sense is advertising that car. Um, people wearing a particular style of clothes or a purse that they're carrying around. Or they could be ads. These are marketing controlled. Right. Evoked set. Again, highlight the word evoked set and highlight that first group of words right there. The group of group of brands resulting from an information search. So what this means simply is when you do a search from a particular, for a particular um, subject, 
you'll get a group of information. You'll get a group of sites or a group of results. From this set, consumers will further evaluate the alternatives and make a choice. Once the evoked set is constructed, the consumer is ready to make a decision. So usually I, I, I'm looking for a particular, you know, particular pair of shoes. I'll do a search. I'll find the kind I like. I'll see the kind I want, see what the prices are, and I'll make a decision from there. You can't really go into shoe stores too much anymore like you used to. I mean, that used to be a whole experience, really. You go into the shoe store, and you, the, the, the person was trained to size your foot with the sizers. And even before my time, they used to do x-rays, which, of course, is bad. They didn't realize that x-ray, you know, is radiation. But anyway, um, but they did have sizers who would size your foot. Then they'd bring out the shoe, they would try it on, and they'd, they'd give you advice as to how it fits and what have you. That really looks good on you. Yeah, that really looks good on you. Um, but anyway, even the stores that we can buy shoes in now have nobody. I mean, you're pretty much on your own. So, and even stores that we can buy shoes are, are starting to disappear. Now we have to buy our shoes online. So you may better, never get that pair of shoes. <laughs> yeah. So you better know how to size your foot. All right. Evaluation of alternatives and purchase. So that evoked set, that's the set of information that we got from our search. We're going to analyze the product's attributes. I like these shoes. I like the way they buckle. I like the fact that they're Mary Janes or they're T-straps and they have a heel. They look nice. The cutoff criteria. I don't want shoes like this or I don't want a price over this amount. I won't pay over $75 for a pair of shoes. Or And then you rank the attributes by importance. What's more important? Is it style or is it the cost? Or is it utility? The comfort. Or the comfort. That's more about utility. Mm -hmm. And then you put that evoke set into the into that process and you come out with a purchase. Or you may you may make a decision not to purchase. That's a, that's that in itself is a choice. All right, alternative evaluation. This stage clarifies the information gathered by number 1 suggesting criteria to use for the purchase. In other words, what I was just saying, the price this is the, this is the bracket price bracket that I will spend. I won't go over this amount. I won't pay cheap for a pair of shoes either because if I pay ten dollars for a pair of shoes, I know that these shoes are probably going to be cheap. There's no way that they could afford to make a good pair of shoes for less than this amount. So charging too little could work against your product as well. Yielding brand names that might meet the criteria, so certain brand names I, I already know about, people have told me, or I have experience with, or I see the commercials. And then developing consumer value perceptions. What I perceive as value, what's important to me. That's going to differ from person to person. Some people it's more about comfort, some people it's more about style, some people it's more about price. Now, all of these are criteria that are important to everybody, but some play a higher role than others. Consumers often have several criteria for evaluation of brands. Companies seek to identify the most important value, such as price and quality. All right, purchase decision. To buy or not to buy. Ultimately, the consumer has to decide whether to buy or not to buy. Whether to buy, when to buy, what to buy, product type or brand, where to buy it, type of retailer, specific retailer, online or in store, and then how to pay. Some people may want to pay by a credit card. Some people want to use their PayPal. Some people want to pay cash. Some people don't want to pay at all. <laughs> Get some mails to buy them. Okay. Cognitive dissonance. Oh, boy. Highlight that word as well as the, the word. Now, in marketing, I mean, this, this word is used in psychology, sociology, in all kinds of contexts. 
in this context where it's the inner tension that a consumer experiences after recognizing an inconsistency between behavior and values or opinions. This is usually after they purchase, a post-purchase feeling. After they bought something, they were expecting something of this quality, but they received something of lesser or not what they wanted. That's cognitive dissonance. And again, that usually occurs in a post-purchase experience. And when I say post-purchase, post means after. So let's talk about post-purchase behavior. Consumers can reduce dissonance by, first of all, seeking information that reinforces positive ideas about the purchase. Get, get information to make sure that what, you're, what you think about this product is true. Avoiding information that contradicts the purchase decision. <laughs> Revoking the original decision by returning the product. Sometimes we can return the product. Um, I bought a pair of shoes, what, six weeks ago? Mm -hmm. I ordered them. They're so cute. I will put a picture of them up and let you guys see them. When I get them, they're so cute. But if I knew that I'd have to wait six to eight weeks before I got them, or even if I do get them, because every time I contact a company, they're giving me this this uh, um, bad tracking tracking number. number that goes nowhere so <laughs> I need to call PayPal and let them know but I'm really I'm experiencing cognitive dissonance because what I expected is not what I'm getting now I might get the shoes tomorrow and be very happy I may not I may not get them at all and hopefully PayPal will be able to sort of solve the problem for me I can't return them because I don't have them <laughs> so marketing can minimize dissonance through effective communications with the purchasers so had they emailed me and said hey you know we're running a little bit late because of the COVID-19 it's just you know it's taking a little bit more time I would have been happy but I've had to email them twice and I'm getting the same standard answer back twice that's not satisfying me so yeah so had they communicated with me I would have been happy all right, involvement. This is the amount of time and effort a buyer invests in the search, evaluation, and decision process of consumer behavior. Now, <clears throat> the more complex the product purchase is, usually more the more expensive it is, the more they're going to involve themselves. Now, if I'm just trying to think about a candy bar I want, it's not going to take a lot of involvement. I may stand at the candy aisle for a few minutes and think, ah, oh, do I want this or do I want that? But it's not going to take a lot of research and I'm usually, I usually know what I'm going to get. But if it's something to do with, you know, maybe at a higher level, like a car, yeah, I'm going to do some research and I'm going to look into it. And it might be a little while before I buy the car because I've done some research and I'm, I want to make sure I get good information. No matter how excited I am to get that new car. All right. Routine response behavior. So highlight that title as well as these two, two first bullets here. So this involves little involvement in the selection process. This is that candy bar. And, you know, hey, go get me a candy bar. Go and get it. You know, you don't have a lot of involvement. Frequently purchased low-cost goods, so bag of chips, soda, um, uh, can of dog food, uh, whatever. At least you know things that are routinely bought. It may stick. You may stick with one brand. Usually, when you have something you like, you pretty much stick with it, unless you find a product you like better. Um, you buy first, you evaluate later. So it, you don't have a great cognitive dissonance if you find you don't like the product because you really didn't lose a great investment. You may say, ah, oh, these things, don't, I don't like them. You don't buy them again. So you usually buy them first before you make a decision or before you evaluate them. And then it's usually a quick decision. You've heard of impulse buys. This is what stores count on, guys. 
when you go into, when you go through the, the check stand and you see a whole bunch of products lining that check stand, that's what they're depending on. They're de depending on this routine response behavior. You see something, you like it, you pick it up, you put it in your basket. And that's what they depend on to get that little bit of extra money out of you as you're leaving the store. You know, good or bad, it is what it is. All right. Limited decision making. So I like the title and this second bullet here. I like that. So this is low levels of involvement. So it's a little bit higher than routine. Low to moderate cost of goods. So this might be like clothing. I have a cell phone listed here, but I think the cell phone is much higher because cell phones are expensive nowadays. They're not like they used to be where you, know, you get one for a couple hundred dollars. Evaluation of a few alternative brands, short to moderate time to decide. So, you know, again, clothing or maybe some costume jewelry or, um, you know, some things that aren't that expensive, but they're not cheap either. And then we have extensive decision making. So highlight these two, first two bullets as well as the last bullet. So high levels of involvement. Again, you're buying a house or a car or maybe some land um, or maybe you're paying for a trip to, to Europe. High cost of goods, evaluation of many brands. So like your flights, you're going to, you're going to check out many different flights to see which is the best. You know, it takes you through the least amount of, you know, of, uh, of um, you know, when you change planes, what do you call it? <laughs> so long since I've Changing planes. Changing planes. <laughs> <laughs> Lay -o layovers? More. Layovers. Layovers. There you are. <laughs> um, long time to decide. So usually you take a little time to decide. I hope you're not deciding to buy a car today and going out and buying it tomorrow. You need to make take some time to make a decision. First of all, you know, can you afford this? Can you afford a car payment? You know, you need to go through that um, thought process. You may experience cognitive dissonance. You get that car, you don't like it. Hopefully, you bought it in a state that has the um, what's it called? No lemon law. No lemon law. Yeah. Or there's a there's a certain amount of time that you have that you can return it without a problem. I think it's 24 hours. Yeah, I'm not sure. Enough yeah. time to get it to a mechanic to have them check it out, to drive it, to see how you feel about it. Yeah. But yeah, but once you drive it off the lot, uh, mm. yeah, cognitive dissonance. Watch out for that. All right. So in summary, much of the behavior that consumers display is learned, but it can also be engaged or motivated by marketing activities. That's what commercials are all about. That's what ads are all about. When a consumer makes a purchasing decision, the engagement can be very limited, as in buying a taco from a local food stand, or extensive as in buying a car. Marketers can help the consumer in either case by making better, make better buying decisions by helping consumers understand their needs and their wants. The more prepared consumers are before they make a purchase, but before they purchase a product, the less cognitive dissonance they will experience. Okay, that is it. So um, that will be chapter five. That's the only chapter that's going to be on the theory test this week. Make sure you study the highlights. Of course, it is open book, so of course you can use your, your notes as well. So I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.